Contrary to popular belief, cows don't fart that much. I mean, cows do fart, but the majority of cow gas emissions actually comes from burping. Cows, along with sheep, goats, camels, and a handful of other animals are what we call ruminants, which means they have a special stomach that can digest plant material that other animals cannot. They do this with the aid of microbes in their gut. They eat stuff, the microbes ferment it, then they regurgitate it, then they chew the cud, and then they swallow and eat it in much the same process that you and I do. This process is responsible for a large amount of methane gas emissions. Animal agriculture is responsible for the majority of methane emissions. And that's important to keep track of because methane is a greenhouse gas, which means it can trap heat in the atmosphere and contribute to climate change, especially the global warming part. Methane is 84 times better than carbon dioxide at trapping heat. So it's a much worse greenhouse gas. Agriculture, aside from emitting a whole bunch of greenhouse gas emissions, is also very energy intensive. It takes a lot of electricity and fuel to produce food, process it, package it, and then ship it, and then you drive, pick it up, and then you have to drive back. Put together, agriculture is responsible for 17% of commercial energy use in the United States. And much of that is actually due to the processing and shipping part. This is because, on average, food items travel 1,500 miles from farm to by the time it actually gets to your plate. Meat production especially is energy intensive because it's not just the effort that goes into raising the cow and processing it into burgers. Don't get me wrong, that's a huge part of it. But don't forget that the majority of land we have is for processing, well, the animal feed. Going back to this map, we know that the majority of our agricultural land is dedicated to supporting livestock. So let's look at the two methods we use to raise animals. One method is free range grazing. And animals that are raised on grazing their entire life cycle are sold as grass fed in the store and are generally more expensive. But it is a healthier life for the animal and the leaner meat, it's arguably better for us. Now we see on the map the land reserved for this type of grazing system is the majority of land we dedicate to raising animals and it's labeled as pasture on the map. A large part of why this is the biggest one is because all animals at least start out on pasture. That said, raising animals on grazing alone has a large land footprint. It takes about 20 times more land to produce the same amount of calories from meat as from plants, and that's mostly due to all the feed we need to grow. Animal agriculture also produces a little bit more carbon dioxide. And since the majority of crops are grown for animal production, the amount of fertilizer used also contributes to greenhouse gas emissions. See, the ammonia and other nitrates in the fertilizer, when it comes in contact with water, produces a gas called nitrous oxide, which is 300 times more potent than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas. And here we thought the methane alone was pretty bad. One of the challenges of allowing animals to graze is the risk of overgrazing, which occurs when too many animals feed on a particular area of land. This leads to a loss of vegetation, because even fast-growing grass would not grow fast enough with its leaves consistently being eaten. This lack of leaves lowers the rate of photosynthesis, which diminishes the amount of nutrients getting to the roots. And we already know what happens when a plant's roots are damaged. Yep, overgrazing leads to soil erosion. But overgrazing can also lead to desertification. The loss of plants, combined with soil erosion, sees a diminished ability for soils to hold water. If an area that has low precipitation experiences overgrazing, this can actually become an issue relatively quickly, especially in the United States. Take a look at this map of average precipitation in the United States. Notice how the central U.S. sees less rainfall and this continues to decrease as you go farther west. Now look at this map of our land use. See, everything in yellow is the location of grasslands for grazing in the U.S. <sighs> yep, where we have areas that are most susceptible to desertification because of low precipitation 
also happens to be the areas where we let our cows graze. Well, this desertification sees environmental impacts, right? The loss of vegetation, the degradation of ecosystems, but it also has an economic impact. Worsening drought due to lower water retention results in increasing difficulty in growing crops, which leads to even more water being pumped from aquifers, which aside from being a water conservation issue is also quite expensive to farmers. This also reduces the economic viability of an area, leading to a lower quality of life for residents. One way to avoid overgrazing is to rotate where animals are allowed to graze. See, once one area is grazed, animals are moved to another to allow the original site to grow back before animals are allowed to eat there again. Now, while this preserves pasture lands and decreases the risk of desertification and kind of mitigate soil erosion a little bit, it does increase the total amount of land needed to raise animals. Now, we can't actually lower the total land footprint by animals. Instead of grazing, we can use a concentrated animal feedlot operation, or a CAFO. These are a way to quickly get livestock, well, large enough and fed enough so they can get to slaughter. This reduces the amount of land occupied by animals, since they're not on a grassland. That's where the majority of agriculture being dedicated to livestock feed actually comes in. See, in a CAFO, animals are fed grains and corn. CAFOs are much more cost-effective, therefore making meat more affordable for consumers. But of course, CAFOs come with big problems, and I don't mean just the ethical ones. Because animals are in such close proximity to each other, the risk of disease spread is high. So the animals are given antibiotics to reduce the risk of this disease transmission. As a result, animal agriculture contributes to the growing problem of antibiotic resistance, which works in a very similar way to the way pesticide resistance works. It's just natural selection of the resistant microbes. CAFOs also produce a lot of animal waste, which needs to be disposed of. All right, but until it's actually disposed of, it's stored in these giant waste lagoons. Though some precautions are taken to reduce the leakage of these, any waste that escapes can run off into nearby bodies of water. Animal waste contains a lot of nutrients, and much like fertilizer use, when it gets into bodies of water, it can cause algal blooms, which result in dead zones. This is especially common in areas with a lot of runoff issues, like agricultural land. As a side note, they also smell absolutely terrible. See, my brother lives in Texas, and I drove down to visit him once, and I was passing down the highway, and an absolutely putrid, engulfing smell um, piqued my interest. So I pulled over at the nearest rest area, I googled up where I was, and lo and behold, there was a CAFO nearby. But the CAFO was one and a half miles away from the highway! Could you imagine how bad it must be there? Ugh. Less consumption of meat could reduce our carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide emissions. And since so many crops are grown for consumption in CAFOs, it would also help conserve water resources and improve soil quality. If you do eat meat, it's much better to buy grass-fed products. But then the question is, well, how much more money is a consumer willing to spend on more sustainable food? Grass-fed beef sells for about $9 per pound. Grain-fed CAFO beef can be as low as 5 This cost difference also exists in plant agriculture. Organic produce is produce that is produced without synthetic fertilizers or synthetic pesticides or the use of genetically modified organisms. As a result, it's significantly more expensive. Per unit of food, organic produce is about 7.5% more expensive than traditionally grown food. And while organic produce has a lower overall environmental impact, because organic farmers don't use any of the modern benefits of synthetic fertilizers, GMOs, and pesticides, and all that stuff, organic farming uses 40% more land to grow the same amount of food. The overall carbon emissions are similar. Most of that comes from processing and shipping. Now, there is a myth that organically produced food is healthier for you than industrially produced food. Now, that is overall a myth. The majority of studies have shown that nutritionally they're virtually exactly identical, and 
to be fair, they carry the same risk of bacterial contamination. But to be fair, organic farming is better for soil conservation and water resources. But as the population of the planet continues to increase, the trade-off between being environmentally friendly and cost-effective is a little pressing. Are we willing to use more land to grow food that's more expensive, uh, that produces lower crop yields, to feed, well, everybody? The debate on this is still not settled. There's an argument to be made both ways, environmentally and economically, and to be honest, my opinions on it keep changing all the time. There's one thing I do know for certain, though. I am probably not having steak today. Nah. No.